The Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, by William Shakespeare. Act One, Scene One, Elsinore, a platform before the castle. Francisco at his post. Enter to him, Bernardo. Who's there? Nay, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. Bernardo? He. You come most carefully upon your hour. Tis now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. Tis bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rifles of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand, ho! Who's there? Enter Horatio and Marcellus. Friends to this ground, and liegemen to the Dane. Give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier. Who hath relieved you? Bernardo has my place. Give you good night. Exit Francisco. Holla, Bernardo. Say, what, is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What, has this thing appeared again to-night? I have seen nothing. Horatio says tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore I have entreated him, along with us, to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, tush, twill not appear. Sit down a while, and let us once again assail your ears, that are so fortified against our story, what we two knights have seen. Well, sit we down. And let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illume that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one, enter ghost. Peace, break thee off. Look where it comes again. In the same figure, like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar. Speak to it, Horatio. Looks it not like the king? Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Question it, Horatio. What art thou, that usurps this time of night together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of buried Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven I charge thee, speak! It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay! Speak! Speak! I charge thee, speak! Exit, ghost. Tis gone, and will not answer. How now, Horatio? You tremble and look pale. Is not this something more than fantasy? What think you on it? Before my God! I might not this believe without the sensible and true avouch of mine own eyes. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Such was the very armour he had on when he the ambitious Norway combated. So frowned he once, when, in an angry parl, he smote the sledded polax on the ice. Tis strange. Thus twice before, and jump at this dead hour. With martial stock hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work I know not. But in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good now. Sit down and tell me, he that knows, why this same strict and most observant watch so nightly toils the subject of the land, and why such daily cast of brazen cannon, and foreign mart for implements of war, why such impressive shipwrights, whose sore task does not divide the Sunday from the week? What might be toward, that this sweaty haste doth make the night joint laborer with the day? Who is it that can inform me? That can I. At least, the whisper goes so. Our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by fourteen brass of Norway, thereto pricked on by our most emulate pride, dared to the combat, in which our valiant Hamlet, for so this side of the known world esteemed him, did slay this fourteen brass who, by a sealed compact, well ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit, with his life, all those his lands which he stood seized of to the conqueror, against the which a moiety competent was gauged by our king, which had returned to the inheritance of Fortinbras had he been vanquisher, as, 
by the same covenant and carriage of the article designed, his fell to Hamlet. Now, sir, young Fortinbras, of unimproved metal hot and full, have, in the skirts of Norway, here and there, sharked up a list of lawless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that has a stomach in it, which is no other, as it doth well appear under our state, but to recover of us, by strong hand and terms compulsatory, those foresaid lands so by his father lost. And this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations, the source of this our watch, and the chief head of this post-haste and roamage in the land. I think it be no other, but e'en so. Well may it sort that this portentous figure comes armed through our watch, so like the king that was and is the question of these wars. A moat it is to trouble the mind's eye. In the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell, the graves stood tenantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets. As stars with trains of fire and dews of blood, disasters in the sun, and the moist star upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands was sick almost to doomsday with eclipse, and even the like precursor of fierce events, as harbingers preceding still the fates and prologue to the omen coming on, have heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climatures and countrymen. But soft, behold, lo, where it comes again! Re-enter, ghost. I'll cross it, though it blast me. Stay, illusion! If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. Cock crows. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily foreknowing may avoid, oh, speak. Or if thou hast abhorred in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which, they say, you spirits oft walk in death, speak of it. Stay and speak. Stop it, Marcellus. Shall I strike at it with my partisan? Do, if it will not stand. Tis here. Tis here. Tis gone. Exit, ghost. We do it wrong, being so majestical, to offer it the show of violence. For it is, as the air, invulnerable, and our vein blows malicious mockery. It was about to speak when the cock crew. And then it started, like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. I have heard... The cock, that is the trumpet to the morn, doth, with his lofty and shrill-sounding throat, awake the god of day. And at his warning, whether in sea or fire, in earth or air, the extravagant and erring spirit hies to his confine. And of the truth herein, this present object made probation. It faded on the crowing of the cock. Some say that ever against that season comes wherein our Saviour's birth is celebrated, the bird of dawning singeth all night long, and then, they say, no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome. Then no planet strike, no fairy takes, nor witch hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is that time. So I have heard, and do in part believe it. But look, the morn, in russet mantle clad, walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. Break we our watch up, and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, this spirit, dumb to us, will speak to him. Do you consent we shall acquaint him with it, as needful in our loves, fitting our duty? Let's do it, I pray, and I this morning know where we shall find him most conveniently. Exeunt. Scene 2. A room of state in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Hamlet, Polonius, Laertes, Voltimand, Cornelius, Lords, and attendants. Though yet of Hamlet our dear brother's death the memory be green, and that it us be fitted to bear our hearts in grief, and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe, yet so far hath discretion fought with nature, that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, 
the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth and funeral and with dirge and marriage, in equal scale, weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. Nor have we herein barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along. For all our thanks. Now follows that you know young Fortinbras, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death our state to be disjoint and out of frame, colleagued with the dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father, with all bonds of law, to our most valiant brother. So much for him. Now for ourself, and for this time of meeting, this much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who, impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose, to suppress his further gate herein, in that the levies, the lists and full proportions are all made out of his subject, and we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltamand, for bearers of this greeting to old Norway, giving to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these dilated articles allow. Farewell, and let your haste command your duty. In that and all things we show our duty. We doubt it nothing. Heartily farewell. Exeunt Voltamand and Cornelius. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is to Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and loose your voice. But wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking. The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? Your leave, and favor to return to France, from whence, though willingly I came to Denmark, to show my duty in your coronation, yet now I must confess, that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France, and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by laboursome petition, and at last, upon his will, I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes, time be thine, and thy best graces spend it at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet, and my son. Aside. A little more than kin, and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I am too much i' the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted colour off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not for ever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest his common. All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Ay, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam. Nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know, your father lost a father, that father lost lost his, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow, but to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled. For what we know must be, and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense. 
Why should we in our peevish opposition take it to heart? Fie! Tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still hath cried from the first course till he that died to-day, this must be so. We pray you, throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son do I impart toward you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you to remain here, in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. In grace whereof no jocund health that Denmark drinks to-day, but the great cannon to the clouds shall tell. And the kings rouse, the heavens all brew it again, re-speaking earthly thunder. Come, away. Excellent all but Hamlet. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God! God! How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie! Aunt! Oh, fie! Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely that it should come to this but two months dead nay not so much not two so excellent a king that was to this hyperion to a satyr so loving to my mother that he might not be teem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Oh, heaven and earth must I remember why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month uh, let me not think on t mm. frailty thy name is woman a little month, or, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, and even she, oh, God, a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules, so <laughs> within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. Oh, most wicked speed! to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Enter Horatio, Marcellus, and Bernardo. Hail to your lordship. I am glad to see you well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. The same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. And what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus? My good lord. I am very glad to see you. Good evening, sir. But what, in faith, make you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good my lord. I would not hear your enemy say so, nor shall you do mine ear that violence. 
to make a truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant. But what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll, uh, teach you to drink deep ere you depart. <laughs> My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray thee, do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift! <laughs> Thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or e'er I would seen that day, Horatio. My father. Methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Saw who? My lord, the king your father. The king my father. Season your admiration for a while with an attent ear, till I may deliver, upon the witness of these gentlemen, this marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two knights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch in the dead vast and middle of the night, been thus encountered. A figure, like your father, armed at point exactly cap a pay, appears before them, and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear-surprised eyes within his truncheon's length, whilst they, distilled almost to jelly with the act of fear, stand dumb and speak not to him. This, to me, in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I, with them, the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good, the apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was this? My lord, upon the platform where we watched. Did you not speak to it? My lord, I did, but answer made it none. Yet once, methought, it lifted up its head, and did address itself to motion, like as it would speak, but even then the morning cock grew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away, and vanished from our sight. It is very strange. As I do live, my honoured lord, tis true, and we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs, but this troubles me. Hold you the watch to-night. We, we do, do, my, my lord. lord. Armed, say you? Armed, Armed my, my lord. lord. From top to toe? My, my lord, from head, head to foot. foot. Then saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord, he wore his beaver up. What? Looked he frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. How would I had been there? It would have much amazed you. Very like, very like. Stayed it long? While one with moderate haste might tell a hundred. Longer, longer, longer. longer. Not when I saw it. His beard was grizzled, no? It was as I have seen it in his life, a sable silvered. I will watch tonight. Perchance will walk again. I warrant it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall hap to-night, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Our, Our duty, duty to your honor. honor. Your loves, as mine to you. Farewell. Excellent all but Hamlet. My father's spirit. In arms. All is not well.
I doubt some foul play. Oh, what the night would come. Till then, sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes. Exit. Scene 3. A room in Polonius's house. Enter Laertes and Ophelia. My necessaries are embarked. Farewell. And, sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Do doubt that. For Hamlet and the trifling of his favor, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, forward not permanent, sweet, not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute, no more. No more, but so? Think it no more, for nature, crescent, does not grow alone in thews and bulk, but as this temple waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide with all. Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor cautel doth besmirch the virtue of his will, but you must fear. His greatness weighed, his will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and health of this whole state, and therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body, whereof he is the head. Then, if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom, so far to believe it, as he in his particular act and place may give his saying deed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes with all. Then weigh what loss your honor may sustain, if with too credent ear you list his songs, or lose your heart, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, and keep you in the rear of your affection, out of the shot and danger of desire. The chariest maid is prodigal enough, if she unmask her beauty to the moon. Virtue itself scapes not calumnious strokes, the canker galls the infants of the spring, Too oft before their buttons be disclosed, And in the morn and liquid dew of youth, Contagious blasments are most imminent. Be wary, then, best safety lies in fear, Youth to itself rebels, though none else near. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But good, my brother, do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whilst, like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. <laughs> oh, fear me not. I stay too long. <laughs> but here my father comes. Enter Polonius. A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second leave. Yet here, Laertes, aboard, aboard for shame. The wind sits in the shoulder of your sail, and you are stayed for. Ah, uh, there, my blessing with thee, and these few precepts in thy memory. Look thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, 
but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them unto thy soul with hoops of steel, but do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new-hatched unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thine ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich, not gaudy, for the apparel oft proclaims the man, and they in France of the best rank and station are most select and generous, chief in that. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell, my blessing season this in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. The time invites you. Go, your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia, and remember well what I have said to you. "'Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Farewell. Exit Laertes. What is, Ophelia, he hath said to you? So please you, something touching the Lord Hamlet. Marry, well be thought. Tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, as so tis put to me, and that in way of caution, I must tell you you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behoves my daughter and your honour. What is between you? Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord of late, made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Pooh! You speak like a green girl, unsifted in such perilous circumstance. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Mary, I will teach you. Think yourself a baby that you should tame these tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. Tender yourself more dearly, or, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase running it thus, you'll tender me a fool. My lord, he hath importuned me with love in honourable fashion. Aye. Fashion you may call it. Go to, go to. And hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Aye, springs to catch woodcocks. I do know when the blood burns how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. These blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both, even in their promise as it is a-making, you must not take for fire. From this time be somewhat scanter of your maiden presence. Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Lord Hamlet, believe so much in him, that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk than may be given you. In few, Avelia, do not believe his vows, for they are brokers not of that dye which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits breathing like sanctified and pious boards, the better to beguile. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment leisure, as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. Exeunt. Scene 4. The Platform. Enter Hamlet. Horatio and Marcellus. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and an eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks of twelve. No, it is struck. Indeed? I heard it not. Then it draws near the season wherein this spirit held his wont to walk. A flourish of trumpets and ordnance shot off within. What does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake to-night and takes his rouse, 
keeps wassail, and the swaggering upspring reels. And as he drains his droughts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? Ay, Mary, ist. But to my mind, though I am native here, and to the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. This heavy-headed revel east and west makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They cleep us drunkards, and with swinish phrase soil our addition. And indeed it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the pith and morrow of our attribute. So, oft it chances in particular men, that for some vicious mole of nature in them, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose his origin, by the o'ergrowth of some complexion, oft breaking down the pales and forts of reason, or by some habit that too much o'erleavens the form of plus of manners, that these men, carrying, I say, the stamp of one defect, being nature's livery or fortune's star, their virtues else, be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular fault. The dram of eel doth all the noble substance of a doubt to his own scandal. Look, my lord, it comes! Enter ghost. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. Bring with thee airs from heaven or blast from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I'll speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet. King. Father. Royal Dane, O oh, answer me! Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hearsed in death, have burst their cerements. Why the sepulchre, wherein we saw thee quietly inured, hath oped his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again? What may this mean, that thou, dead corse, again in complete state? Deal revisitest thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls. Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? Ghost beckons Hamlet. It beckons you to go away with it, as if it some impartment did desire to you alone. Look, with what courteous action it waves you to a more removed ground. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why? What should be the fear? I do not set my life in a pin's fee. And for my soul, what can it do to that, being a thing immortal as itself? It weighs me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord, or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles o'er his base into the sea, and there assume some other horrible form which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness? Think of it! The very place puts toys of desperation, without more motive, into every brain that looks so many fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It waves me still. Go on, I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands! Be ruled, you shall not go. My fate cries out, and makes each petty artery in this body as hardy as a Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called, unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say away. Go on. I'll follow thee. Exeunt ghost and Hamlet. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. "'Tis not fit thus to obey him.' "'Have after. 
To what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay, let's follow him. Exeunt. Scene 5. Another part of the platform. Enter Ghost and Hamlet. Where wilt thou lead me? Speak. I'll go no further. Mark me. I will. My hour is almost come, when I to sulfurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Alas, poor ghost! Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak! I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to waste in fires, to the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars start from their spheres, thy knotted and combined and locks depart, and each particular hair to stand upon end like quills upon the fretful porcupine. But this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. List, list, O oh list, if thou didst ever thy dear father love. Oh God! Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder. Murder most foul as in the best it is, but this most foul, strange, and unnatural. Haste me to note that I, with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. I find thee apt. And duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in ease on Lethe Wharf, would thou not stir in this. Now Hamlet here. Tis given out that sleeping in mine orchard a serpent stung me, so the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused. But know, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. O oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle. I. That incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wit, with traitorous gifts, O oh, wicked wit and gifts that have the power so to seduce, one to his shameful lust the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. O oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there! From me, whose love was of that dignity that it went hand in hand even with the vow I made to her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. But virtue, as it never will be moved, though lewdness courted in a shape of heaven, so lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. But soft, methinks I sent the morning air. Brief let me be. Sleeping within mine orchard, my custom always in the afternoon. Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole, with juice or cursed heaven and in a vial, and in the porches of mine ears did pour the leprous distillment whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man that, swift as quicksilver, it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with a sudden vigor if doth posset incurred, like eager droppings into milk the thin and wholesome blood, so did it mine, and a most instant tetter barked about, most lazar-like with vile and loathsome crust all my smooth body. Thus was I sleeping, by a brother's hand, of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched, Cut off even in the blossoms of my sin. Unhouseled, disappointed, unannaled. No reckoning made but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. Oh, horrible! Oh, horrible, most horrible! If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But howsoever thou pursuest this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven, and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge, to prick and sting her. Fare thee well at once, the glowworm shows the mountain to be near, and begins to pale his ineffectual fire. Adieu, adieu, Hamlet, remember me. Exit Ghost. Oh, all you host of heaven! Oh, earth! What else? Then shall I couple hell? Oh, fie! Hold my heart, and you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee. 
I, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this destructed globe, remember thee. Yea, from the table of my memory I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copy there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter, yes, by heaven, O oh, most pernicious woman, O oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain, my table's meet, it is, I set it down, one may smile and smile and be a villain, at least I am sure it may be so in Denmark. Writing. Hmm. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is adieu, adieu, remember me. I have sworn. Within. My lord, my lord. Lord Hamlet. Heaven secure him. So be it. Within. Hello! Ho, 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 my lord! Hello, ho, ho, boy! Come, bird, come! Enter Horatio and Marcellus. How is it, my noble lord? What news, my lord? No, oh, wonderful! Good, my lord, tell it! No, you'll reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven! Nor I, my lord. How say you, then? Would heart of man once think it? But you'll be secret? Ay, by, by heaven, my lord. my lord. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's an errant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. My right, you are the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You, as your business and desire shall point you, for every man has business and desire such as it is, and for mine own poor part, look you, uh, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I am sorry if they offend you. Heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. <laughs> There's no offence, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is, Horatio, and much offence, too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost, that let me tell you, for your desire to know what is between us, or master it as you may. And now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars, and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is, my lord? We will. Never make known what you have seen to-night. My, my lord, lord, we, we will, will not. not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Nor I, my lord, in faith. Upon my sword. We have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed. Upon my sword, indeed. Beneath. <laughs> Ha, oh, ha, boy, sayst thou so? Art thou there, true penny? Come on, you hear this fellow in the cellarage consent to swear. Propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen swear by my sword. Beneath. <laughs> ah, hicca to beak, eh? <laughs> then we'll shift our ground. Come here, the gentlemen, and lay your hands again upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard swear by my sword. Beneath. <laughs> well said, old mole. Canst work of the earth so fast, worthy pioneer. Once more remove, good friends. Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, here, as before, never, so help you mercy, how strange or odd, so e'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on that you, at such times seeing me, never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this head shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase, as, well, well, we know, or we could, and if we would, or if we list to speak, or there be, and if they might, or such ambiguous giving out note, that you know aught of me, this not to do, so grace and mercy at your most need help you, 
swear. Beneath. <laughs> rest, rest, perturbed spirit. They swear. So, gentlemen, with all my love I do commend me to you. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is may do, to express his love and friending to you, God willing, shall not lack. Let us go in together, and still your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Nay, come, let's go together. Excellent. End of Act One.